in the Clive Barker podcast. Longtime fans Ryan and Jose interview guests, bring you news, and take deep dives into Barker related stuff. In episode 453, we're joined by writer Peter Atkins as we dive into Hellbound to continue our series exploring the new Hellraiser box set, The Quartet of Torment. This episode is sponsored by Don Bertram's Celebrate Imagination. Don Bertram is a longtime friend of Clive and advocate of his art, but Don's unique and inspiring paintings are for sale and over 50% of the proceeds go to the Arts and Medicine program at the Texas Children's Cancer Center. There's even a paver in Washington, D.C. representing Celebrate Imagination. We're thrilled that this worthy cause is sponsoring our podcast again this year, and we hope that you'll consider looking over the Etsy shop to buy one of his original paintings or books. Follow the link in the show notes or click the side banner and let's see what's new with Don Bertram today. Check out the painting You Can't Keep Him on his Facebook page. On his Etsy shop, you can still find the original paintings The Stargazer, The Folk Singer, The Pearl, Balancing Act 2, Mother and Child 2, The Portal 2, Top of the World, and don't forget about his books, The Chimney Sweep's Tale, and Don Bertram's Celebrate Imagination and the Imaginaries. Well, welcome. This is episode 453 of the Clive Parker podcast. And, and uh, welcome. Today, we're going to be talking about we're, we're, our slow uh, trip through the Quartet of Torment, the 4K Hellraiser release. We are on disc two, Hellbound, and we have a special guest, Peter Atkins. Uh, welcome. Hi. Hi, guys. Thank you for having me back. Nice to see you both again. Yeah, it's so good to have you again. We're uh, we're uh, joined by Alf as well here in my little keychain. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> nice. So um, today we're going to be talking about this wonderful set, which is the, the definitive, I would call it, uh, edition yeah. of the Hellraisers 1 through 4, which some people might argue could be... Uh, Possibly the best four movies of the whole franchise. Um, well, that would that would be striking an opinion and an attitude, wouldn't it? I I think the easiest <laughs> thing to say is it's the four theatrical. Hell that's races. right. Yeah. That's correct. That yeah, was the last. Actually, it really was nice for me when because you know there's this whole complicated who owns the rights, whichever yeah. studio or mega corporation oh, yes. has inherited the rights from the various people who used to hold them. So Bloodline. Until this release, as far as I know, certainly in this territory, had never been allowed to join its fellow three theatrical. Right. Movies. Yeah. Because uh, you know we had the Scarlet Box about ten years ago or whatever. Yeah. Um, but Bloodline was usually packaged, and again, not making any judgments here, though clearly you may read the subtext if you so wish. <laughs> um, Bloodline had always been packaged with the later. With, with the other Miramax movies, you know, the, uh, which yeah. were all direct-to-video titles. And and I know, I know there are Hellraiser fans who really like number five, Inferno, which I still haven't seen. Um, <laughs> but I know, but people say it's really good. And it, that's the Scott Derrickson one, right? So yeah, that's sure right. That's right. Yeah. Um, but I always felt it was like, God, it's not like, it's, as if Bloodline hadn't suffered enough yeah, you know, to get put in with the direct the, video. The final ones. indignity. It's not allowed yeah. to join the other three theatrical movies. So this this box uh, was great and packed with extras. I know. Yeah. Which, although, I mean, just for the record, I, well, not only do you guys know about it, I think it was you who told me about it. There is now a an almost as good set mm -hmm. for, I think, not significantly cheaper, but but certainly less expensive. And the only thing you miss is the book. It's now released as, do they just call it the Hellraiser Tetralogy? Is that what it that, is? That's right. That's oh, right. That's Yeah. Yeah. That's right. You're correct. Yeah. And I think all, all the extras have been imported over. You just don't get Phil and Sarah's book. So I they're the same I, I discs. I don't have a copy of that. Yeah, and probably it, the packaging isn't as fancy as this, no. It's know, with, it's yeah. that packaging that's got a little bit of a purplish color and yes. red, and it's got the four centibytes standing well, right exactly. next to each other. And yes. here's the thing, guys. I mean, 
the packaging not as good, Ryan? How dare you, sir? <laughs> because the Cenobite they chose to put on the cover of the Hellraiser 3 box art was Barbie. So, well, I uh, said not as fancy. Not, yeah. I didn't say it's not as good. <laughs> That's true. Um, I actually, um, I think S Stephen Kim, who did the commentaries on all four of the movies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Um, I think they just rattled Arrow's cage on our behalf. And I think yeah, Steve Kim and I will be getting copies of the, you know, oh, the good. budget level. Yeah. The, the ones with the sometime this week. That's so, a trilogy, yeah. This one is, yeah. it's quite a chore to take it out and put it back in. But uh, so it's like you said, this one uh, yeah. has the book. The tetralogy is missing the book, which is right. this beautiful... Ages of Desire. It's uh, yeah. about Hellraiser franchise written by Phil yeah. and Sarah Stokes. Good stuff in here. A lot of good mm -hmm. pictures. And then you have this nice digipack thing that opens up in four parts. Sure. And that goes into this fancy looking plastic thing. And this is always yeah. the tricky bit. This is a tricky thing. I'm not <laughs> yeah. going to put it in now. <laughs> but... Yeah. Disc two is Hellbound, and it's like you said, chock full of extras. And I think we're reaching 35 or 36 years that uh, Hellbound was number one in the UK, right? Uh, was a... just this last week, yeah. Yeah, um, which what's funny is, uh, I until three years ago, I didn't know that that had ever happened. I guess I'm trying to think back to 1989. Is that is that thirty five years ago? Yeah, um, mm. I must have been in LA working possibly on on a version of Hellraiser three, probably not the one that we ended up making. Right. But, um, but you know, when you're busy, you don't. I nobody called me from the UK to say we're number one in the UK. So it was only there was a Twitter account that I think is gone now in the big sort of you know post Elon purge or right yeah. us out. Um, but it was a Twitter account three years ago that uh, made an announcement of 35 years. Yeah, it was just one of those on this date in horror history yeah. kind of posts. So I found out that we'd, you know, we'd had a number one hit. <laughs> wow. And, yeah. and yes, the la last week would have been the 35th anniversary. So I was watching so the a, old TV. great. The... And B, we're so fucking old. Oh, my God. <laughs> I was watching the old uh, trailers that were on this disc and... There was one of them that just showed like people coming out of the theater and talking about it, which was kind of cool. I don't remember there being trailers like that back then, but they were saying, oh, it was amazing. Oh, the, how did the one lady was like, how did that guy get those pins in his head? <laughs> um, and and uh, and but a bunch of people said, oh, it's better than the first one, which is, that's, you know, it's, de like it's definitely bigger and more intense you know i think than than sure. the first one i, I yeah. never i never claim it's better and not, neither does tony randall um the the you know the original is still the greatest and all that stuff but it's um, it's subjective it depends on you know what your sure. criteria is for sure. you know and certainly time has been very kind and now yeah. you <laughs> when they do the polls which they seem to do a lot um yeah. You often get it, it seems to be between those yeah. two, you know, yeah. Hell, Hellraiser or Hellbound tend to come in number one from uh, from the absolutely, family, which is yeah, very nice. You I, know, I, and can... I think the last time we were talking about the the plot of it, there is a lot going on, right? There's there's um, Kirsty versus the Cenobites, Kirsty versus Shenard, um, Shenard, uh, Julia versus Shenard, Kirsty versus Julia, Tiffany versus Julia versus Shenard. Shenard. It's a love story, right? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Up until she tricks him. Right. Now Julia versus that. Frank and Kirsty versus Frank. Sure. Yeah. And so I... there, there's a lot going on in there. And, and, and while I was going through all these special features, I was kind of thinking about the movie and I thought if there was, um, you know, one small part of the story is is just well, it's not small; it's the whole setting. But but Shenard and Tiffany and the mental hospital. Right. If there was just that, you know, and then uh, and then maybe the ending would be that the Cenobites realize that that they're that he's using Tiffany to uh, to open the box for himself, sure. and then the Cenobites take him away. That would have been a, an amazing comic book story, you know, from the old '90s comics. 
Sure, or or like you know, an eighty minute second string Hammer movie from the from the sixties. Yeah. It could have you know because they would have had the one location like you know. Yeah, a friend of mine's got a mansion, and they're away for the weekend. Let's shoot. <laughs> yeah, um, so yeah, could have could have done the whole thing. Yeah, but but yeah. a short kind of anthology story that that's an amazing short story. But there's there there's a lot of other stuff going on at the same time. Yeah, yeah. which is cool. I mean, it, it's a it's a really nice um, kind of a roller coaster of a of a movie. It's it, uh, it, it's just it's delightful that people still dig it. You know, thirty five yeah. years later. So. So I, I, we probably talked about this. Um, I don't know if this would have come up before. I, I know I've talked about it somewhere, but there's this weird thing that happens with movies where I think all movies, not, not just horror movies, where mm -hmm. 10 years after mm -hmm. the initial release, um, everything looks a little hokey. But, you know, in terms both of if, yeah. if, if it's a speculative fiction movie of any kind it can be the special effects might look dated um but also just things ridiculous things like fashions and hairdos yeah and so you get this weird period where things just look awful i mean no, yeah not old enough to be nostalgic like, right oh my god i can't believe yeah. they dressed like that <laughs> yeah um and i think everything goes through through that and then after 20 years it's no longer um outmoded it's yeah. historical and you know they, they just become period pieces and they don't look uh, they don't outrage people's current <laughs> fashion senses yeah right especially because fashion being almost cyclical sometimes eventually things start becoming fashionable again and yeah. and movies often get rediscovered all the time or whether uh, yes something like this coming out maybe not this one because this is the fancy one that not everybody's going to buy but the t tetralogy that's why these uh releases revitalize uh these old franchises in a way um sure, sure. and i mean old franchises with all utmost respect because the franchise is not dead yet we just had another hulu movie um but back then I guess it was inevitable that they would uh, come out and say, let's do another movie, because the first one was so good. Uh, around the second time, this was your first uh, official uh, movie screenplay, right, that that you uh, ever wrote? First official and unofficial. I mean, I'd never. Right. When we were in dog, I, I know, you know, your viewers are hardcore, so I don't need <laughs> to explain everything, but when way back in the 70s when Doug Clive and I were in Dog Company, mm -hmm. um, we'd made movies, um, both the two or three that you've seen that were finished, and as usual with Dog Company, a whole bunch of shit that we never finished, never got around to, a lot of unrealized projects. So I guess technically I'd written a shot list or two in the past, but I had no real sense of what uh, mm. professional professionally formatted screenplays looked like so yeah it was it was my first one and uh and I, I really didn't realize how lucky i was at beating the odds because you know then i meet a lot of i, I met then and still know a lot of screenwriters my age and it was like mm -hmm. oh yeah my 15th script finally <laughs> sold and i was there. yeah and i was like oh 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 it's meant to be that hard oh um so you know it was very, very helpful to have been an old colleague of Doug and Clive's. So there was uh, an opportunity to to step in. In one of these features, the the one that's called Hell Was What They Wanted with Kit Powers and George Daniel Lee, right. mm -hmm. they, they were heaping a bunch of praise on this movie. But one of the things that they said was that it breaks all of these rules, like that it showed all of the best parts of the original Hellraiser, all the goriest parts. Uh -huh. in the introduction to to show you like flashback of what happened in the first movie right. and they Previously said on. yeah and uh and and i think you had said in in the 2000 commentary on there that that might have been the last movie that did that kind of thing where you're you're spending a, a bunch of time explaining what happened in the first uh -huh. movie yeah i guess yeah. I guess there was a little bit of an intro there, right? And even they used yeah. some stuff from the original Hellraiser that was never used in the first movie as well. So, 
Yeah. Oh, well, that I didn't know, Joe. That's interesting. Yeah, in that opening montage, the I, the, the, the oh, wedding oh, stuff. The, yeah, the wedding stuff. I think right. the wedding. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I yeah, think that was right. from the first one. I, I got a uh, one of the great things about this Arrow um, release uh, is that it's so British. Like you, you were just talking about that hell is what they wanted with George and the yeah. power. Yeah. And it's just like a couple of mates at the bar just talking about a movie. And it, it goes on for yeah. like an hour, an hour and 20 a half minutes. Yeah. yeah. Right. It almost takes as long as the movie. And I was listening <laughs> yeah. to that and I was like, yeah, I mean, for someone like me who's. I would say I wouldn't call myself obsessive, but I would say that I've 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 delved a lot over the last thirty years into the Hellraiser franchise, and I've sure. pretty much seen a lot of what's out there to see. But it was still pretty entertaining to listen to them just talking about that and heaping praise on the movie and all the things that they liked and 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 stuff like that. We so we that can't was, fault them for taking right. an hour and a half to talk about Clive Barker and Hellraiser. That's right. That's right. We we'll, we'll <laughs> promise we'll that, be that would little... be pretty hypocritical of us. Will be more yeah. succinct, <laughs> but right, uh, right. At, you've got that Morning Star poster behind you. I think at the time that you worked on the script, you had finished the draft of Morning Star as well, right? Yes. I, I, well, I'd written a, a novella length piece mm. called at that, at that point it was called The Vampires of Summer, and it was sort of that that got me the job mm -hmm. uh, to to write Hellbound. I mean, obviously, I. I'm going to assume Clive already trusted me, but Chris Fig didn't know me from Chris Fig, the producer, didn't know me from Adam. Um, and I'm. It was either a, another story I wrote called Eternal Delight or The Vampires of Summer. I think it was The Vampires of Summer that Clive gave to Chris. As a, I mean, not that that proves you can write a movie, but at least it sort of it proves you can write a sentence. You know, so, <laughs> so Chris had read that. Um, I don't think, and then, then I expanded it to novel length. Um, I think after we shot Hellbound, um, I I certainly wasn't doing it during. Um, but yeah, it was all that was my first book and first movie was sort of. Sort of happening at the same time, yeah. And and now people can get the audio book of that narrated by Doug Bradley. That's uh, right. By the dog Morning Star Hell himself. That's yeah. yeah. So I've I've uh, been also looking into this uh, wonderful Phantasmagoria issue, um, right. where I've got one. Right. A lot of stuff in here about a lot of good stuff that especially came from. Stephen Jones, who also uh, participates in uh, the commentary track in this second disc with Kim Newman, like you said. Yeah. And of course, Stephen Jones, uh, great chap, uh, publicist for Hellraiser 2 and 1 and 2 and one, Nightbreed, one, two, I believe. Three yeah. three, yeah. And so he had such great insight throughout the whole commentary track. And I'm sure. he kept detailed copies of everything that he had and all that stuff. Cause he was like, at one point he understood that when you're involved with a movie, if you don't keep copies of the stuff that's important, um, the production company will just put all that in the file and stuff it away somewhere and you'll never see it again. So he just sure. started keeping copies of all that stuff. Right. Um, which, which is great because he had so much material to offer to Phantasmagoria. Um, oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. He had all, I think a whole bunch of, Previously untranscribed and certainly unpublished interviews with the, pretty much the whole cast of the first movie, I think, right? Or, right. I mean, certainly Chris and Clive and Doug. And All Ashley. those people, yeah. yeah. And so I was reading that, and I, I read something. I'm not sure if it was in here or it was another different interview, but I've heard you say that Christopher Fig had some ideas about how the story should flow, that he wanted dialogue to be kind of short, no more than three or four sentences. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah. So it does have that kind of dynamic flowing uh, feel throughout Hellbound, but Hellraiser 3 has a lot more monologues and a lot more longer like scenes. So was it because, did you find that, so was that Hellraiser 3, did you get more room to like, because Chris Fig wanted shorter sentences and shorter dialogue in Hellraiser 3, did you let it flow more because he wasn't there anymore? Like so, my revenge. Again. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, absolutely not. Um, okay. Was, Chris was fantastic. He was a great producer, and as, as I've said many times, so I won't bore the viewers with it again. But without Chris, there wouldn't have been a Hellraiser. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, creatively, 
I'm talking about the first movie. Um, creatively, the first movie is all Clive. But in terms of getting the damn thing made, that was Chris. Chris made that yeah. happen. New, everybody had said no. New World had said no. And then Chris showed him the negatives or, you know, whatever he had over them. He, not at all. He he talked him into it. He he explained why this was going to be a hit for them. So Chris was a great producer and a great guy. Um, and I, I'm very tempted to make jokes and go with, yeah, but once the shackles were off, I just wrote on it. <laughs> um, but it wasn't that. And in fact, it was very, it was very gentle and very subtle because I'm sure that although he didn't express it to me, because that would not have been good psychologically for the guy, he was installing me in a hotel. I've been on the dole in Liverpool. He's putting me in a hotel in Hampstead in the hope that I will hand him a screenplay three weeks later. So he knew that psychologically he shouldn't express any nervousness about my uh, neophyte nature. So it had been very cool and very easy. And then literally just as I was leaving the room after our, only our second meeting, I think. Um, have you guys ever interviewed Chris? Have, have you met No, him? we haven't. No, I would love to, uh, yeah. You've, you've seen him on the on the Leviathan disc. So. We did, yes. yes. So, yeah. You know that unlike me, Doug, and Clive, he's not some working class job from Liverpool. He sounds like King Charles. Very posh. He's <laughs> a posh, po posh lad. Um, but he's got that that very nice sort of clipped um, upper class English voice. And as I was leaving, he just said, oh, oh, Pete. And I turned back. And that's when he said, I think this is what you're referring to, Joe. He said very casually and very friendlily, um, remember, I don't see any dialogue longer than that. And <laughs> I said, oh, okay. Because it was news to me, you know. Right, um, right. And what what he was telling me or, you know, reminding me, I, I like to think I might have known instinctively because I'd written fiction in which people have conversations, obviously. But it's very important that although there are no rules as as is the is the only rule writers should ever tell other writers there are no rules mm -hmm. um but the you know there's certain things you should probably pay attention to so you can do monologues you can do voiceovers you can do all the stuff that assholes um who like to make rules tell you you can't do you can right. of course but what chris was making sure i understood was this is a movie, not an Elizabethan drama. We want dialogue, not speeches. Right. Mm. Now, and again, I apologize, because I think I've said this before, though not necessarily on your show. Um, <clears throat> I do know that the very first thing, the very first piece of dialogue in the Hellbound script is a very long monologue by Chenard about the labyrinth of the brain. So... And I genuinely don't know if that was subconsciously or consciously my, yeah, fuck you. I'm going to write a long monologue <laughs> to open this movie. But I don't know. I mean, I genuinely can't remember because I, I I might have sequenced it differently when I first yeah. did it. But, um, I think but you're talking about that. The mind is a labyrinth, the puzzle, and while the paths exactly. of the labyrinth are plain exactly. visible. It, it was yeah, certainly yeah. longer than that on the page, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, but but Chris's advice was good. That is, mm -hmm. um, you should you should always remember. Yeah, yeah. and the, I'm not going to name any names, but there are, there are a couple of very lauded screenwriters and TV writers who are praised for their dialogue. Right, and and I have to say that a couple of them, I don't think they write dialogue. I think they write fucking speeches. And um, <laughs> I watch some of these shows, and I think. Nobody in the world has ever spoken to each other like this. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, so Chris yes. just had his, his finger. And then when it came to number three, Joe, it, it, just to wrap up your very long-winded answer to your question, I apologize. Um, consciously, the, the one, I, I don't think I was, um, oh, Chris isn't here. I can, I can babble on. Right. Um, but I do think by then... Unlike when when we were doing Hellbound, because Hellraiser, you got to remember, hadn't been released when I wrote the first, I think the first three drafts of Hellbound. The movie still hadn't come out. Oh, um, but you'd uh, probably seen it, right? 
Oh, when it oh was, sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, yeah. No, it was just a coincidence. I just I, I thought about these guys with pins in their faces, and it turned out they'd been in the first movie too. Um, yeah. No, I I I definitely seen it. Um, why was I saying? Oh, right. But by the time we were doing number three, one and two had been hits. I mean, minor hits, not Nightmare on Elm Street size hits, but they've mm -hmm. been hits. Yeah. So we knew by then that people were into Pinhead and and they sort of liked, I mean, he doesn't have long speeches in Hellbound, but he had, you know, he has some of those nice pithy phrases that still show up on t-shirts today, you know? Yeah. Right. yeah. The, the, the no tears, please. It's a waste of yeah. good suffering. Or in the Hellbound, uh, that scene where she runs into hell and finds the Cenobites in the crossroads and they have a little powwow. Oh, they have a, -wow. a little teasing chat. Yeah. yeah sure. Um, but I, I, again, it was, it was unconscious, not conscious. Um, mm -hmm. but my, my best guess at answering your question is that I sort of knew the audience would be happy to indulge listening to this articulate oh, monster. So articulate nice. Articulate monstrosities, you know. Um, he really becomes much more articulate in, in Hellraiser 3, Hell on Earth. Um, even though he's always been like that charming, you know, charismatic Doug Bradley and makeup, regal, all that stuff. Sure. But it's in Hellraiser 3 that some of the those big monologues do uh come out and 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 kind of grab you and uh you know uh maybe it, it a little is. a little too embellished sometimes, maybe, but uh <laughs> but and they, his delivery they, they, is they have... really is really important too, because I, I watching one of the TV spots, you know, at the end. The yes. the um the announcer guy was like Hellbound Hellraiser two time to play check your local listings for for showing times oh the trailer <laughs> yeah so the music on this uh, uh, also was uh, pretty bombastic it, it they tried to Chris Young really try to top the stuff he had done for yeah. Hellraiser one one of the features that's on this disc as well is um, the one that talks about uh, the, the it's called Rat Slice. It's called that rat slice sound. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. and it's this wonderful uh, guy Adams talking about um, just just basically lavishly praising uh, Chris Young's work and and yeah. how he ended up becoming the the score guy. It comes back to the first Hellraiser when they replaced sure. Coil with Chris because they had more money, and uh, and it's it's quite well, a soundtrack, no, that's right? Interesting. Uh, to now, to my knowledge, that was not why. Okay. I mean, Chris was not. I don't think Chris cost less money than Coil would have. I, I'm not privy to any. Oh no, I meant it that that's when they decided to invest more money in the production to complete uh, Hellraiser One. I think that's when they oh, also made sorry. the decision. Made the yeah. decision to replace right. it with an orchestral uh, soundtrack. Yes, right. um, yeah, that yeah. was that was really Tony Randall's doing, as as, as yeah. I think everybody has said. On on interviews, I mean, probably including Steve Thrower from Coil. I mean, he probably doesn't say it in quite the friendly way that other people. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, Tony. Again, I, I know your viewers know this, but Tony had been a development executive at New Orleans, mm -hmm. was the suit assigned to Hellraiser, I get the first movie, um, and it was. You know, everybody's plight. It, 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 so I want to be careful in how I said it. it wasn't Tony Randall didn't say you can't have this bizarre. Uh, how would you describe? I, mean, I was going to say industrial rock, but that that's not a fair description of that. Oh, you're talking about the yeah. sure the Coil soundtrack. Yeah, I would say yeah. more. You know, it it would become dated pretty quickly, I guess, because it was part of this genre of music that was popular at the time. But I, I, music is can be very fickle, and and music genres fall out of uh, style and stuff. So I'm not sure how that would have stood the test of time with the Coil soundtrack. But it was definitely yeah, more I mean, experimental, it, it right? It might have been. It might have been great. They they've released the music since. Uh, is my yeah. Guess. You can they get have. a CD yeah. of it, but it, it's yeah. expensive now to 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 buy. 
Some people have tried to edit that into the uh, Hellraiser oh, into the movie. movie. Oh, yeah, yeah, and it's it, uh, it's it's interesting exercise. When sure. you might find that on YouTube here and there, but yeah. uh, but they they would, didn't finish it, so it's not enough music really right. for the whole movie. That's right. 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 Yeah. It do- doesn't fit quite as neatly as Dark Side of the Moon yeah. fits with the of ours, right. <laughs> right. Yeah, and it was only meant to be like, this is kind of what it's going to sound like. And they didn't yeah, actually they score the movie. Three or four themes to, to give a sense mm-hmm. of. And I, I don't think Tony had any, you know, negative judgments about the music per se. Yeah. My understanding is that he said, this can be a bigger picture mm-hmm. if you have... Yeah. Again, using it in an unloaded way, a traditional symphonic score. Um, and he had known Chris. Because, I mean, Chris always says, I owe my career to Tony Randall, Chris Young, mm-hmm. um, says I owe my career to Tony because as an exec, he brought Chris on, I want to say DEF CON 4, but I don't think it was that. That was slightly later. But a couple of smaller New mm. World Pictures movies, mm-hmm. Um like so, uh, Fist of the North Star, or uh, no, that was that was a good three or four years after. Okay, gotcha, after, gotcha. After Hellbound, um, I'm going to say Defcon Four because that okay. might have preceded Hellbound, but yeah. you can look up the filmographies on IMDb, folks. And, yeah. And um, whatever it was, Chris's one first couple of scores had been greenlit by Tony as a, an mm. exec. So he oh, made see. the recommendation to Chris Fig and Clive on the first movie. And then, you know, that was so fucking fantastic. There was yeah. no question about us bringing him back for Hellbound. And obviously I speak from a position of prejudice, but um, I think you said earlier, Joe, uh, he wanted to outdo himself. And I think he did. I think mm-hmm. the score for Hellraiser is magnificent. But I think the score for Hellbound, despite my prejudice and, and my familial involvement, just objectively, I think that the score for Hellbound is is a masterpiece. Oh and yeah, not it's just amazing. Not movie scoring, but well, movie. yeah, they 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 even took it for Spider Man too. They oh, yeah <laughs> yeah yes yeah and I, he you can see him in the small prints at the back. Um, yeah, and, I remember. And I guess then they gave him the job for Spider Man Three, right? Because, That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I can't remember. Obviously, Sam Raimi had, you know what the phrase temp track means, right? They just, mm-hmm. yeah. Yep. Before you bring your composer in, the director arrogantly Jesus. and illegally pastes some music onto it so yeah. that the composer has a sense of what, yeah. uh, what they want for the thing. So, obviously, I say obviously, I, you'd have to ask Sam Raimi, I can't prove this, but he'd obviously tempt the Doc Ock fight with mm-hmm. Chris's music from Hellbound. Oh, yeah. Well, and him um, rising up, you know, like Dr. Shenard. I'm, no shit. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. Um, so my assumption, I have no evidence for this, is that he tempted with Chris's music. And then Danny, um, who, of course, you know, came into the family later because he did Nightbreed. But um, Danny... Well, not later. Spider-Man was after that. But anyway, I'm sorry. Um, Danny then scored that scene the way Sam obviously wanted him to score it, which effectively meant, wait a minute, that still sounds remarkably like Chris's themes. And as a consequence, there's a credit at the end of the movie. It's one of those weird things where I don't think they say, because it's not Chris's score. It's not... The equivalent in like rock music or pop music, it's it's not that Chris's score was sampled. Mm-hmm. Um, this was newly orchestrated and scored as part of Danny's score. Huh. So the credit, I don't know, it's some kind of weird like Harlan Ellison's credits at the end of Terminator. It's some right kind of legal acknowledgement that um themes huh. from Christopher Young employed it or whatever. Sure, um, sure. But then as a consequence, Chris got to score Spider-Man three. Um, that's that's great. I mean, I remember sitting when I was sitting watching Hellbound in the theater, the the few times I've got a chance to do that. It it's always beautiful when you're sitting there and you feel the rumble of the horns and at the opening oh, yeah. with that wonderful opening that's like a black mass taking place and it's right. it's so impressive. And for a long time, 
I only had a videotape that I would sometimes have to play to listen to the music if I wanted to listen to it. And I still remember the joy that I had when I first got a chance to get the score as an album. And I was like, oh, my God, I can listen to the whole thing now in good quality. Yeah. And I, I wore that thing out. I, I really did wore that <laughs> thing vinyl out. Or a cassette? The vinyl The vinyl. Wow. The one that has the wonderful picture of the Cenobites in the oh, front yeah. and that's, all that. It's, yeah, it's great. It's, great. it's did, great. Did that have High Point soundtrack on it also? Yeah, I think it did. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, it some, on the vinyl. It de they definitely included it for some reason on, think, on the CD. So. CD. Yeah. That's the one that I have is the CD. Yeah. But what, uh, what? Think, I'm not sure it's on the vinyl because, you know, because vinyl. Um, as you youngsters might or might not know, vinyl has less time right. available yeah. than CD. So I'm not sure it's on. I think you're right. I think that one is just the cues for Hellbound now that I look it up. I think oh, okay. what I've listened to uh, with High Point was the CD as well, which I also have. But I kind of mix those sure. two up. Sure. Yeah. Well, and now now there's been uh, these these double disc fancy releases of, of yeah. uh, oh, the, the Nightbreed soundtrack and, and, Hell, and um, Lord of Illusions and Candyman. And so I, you know, we we were talking about this on a previous episode, but they should do that with Hellraiser one and two, put them together into sure. one, you know, into one big release. Oh, right. Well, they did. I, they, no, they, they did do that. Um, I don't think there was a Hellraiser that, trilogy, they did right? Very nice with new about five years ago, maybe just mm -hmm. just before lockdown. Oh, I you're remember. talking about those wonderful uh, vinyls they released. Oh, the with Mondo. Pinhead on the Mondo, Mondo editions, ones. right? Yeah. With Pinhead yeah. on the cover. Yeah. But yeah, those are really good. The gatefold oh, and all yeah. that stuff. Yeah, yeah. those are yeah. those are beautiful. I'm I'm still impressed, Joe, that, that you could wear a vinyl out. Yeah. I mean, that that is some <laughs> that is some dedication. That is some yeah, I thought you had work. to leave it out in the sun to do that. Oh, oh, yeah. uh, oh, oh yeah. well, you know, you're running a diamond all tip all on it. Ways to fuck vinyl up. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Usually just playing it. Yeah. Every wow. time you play it, you're slightly damaging it. You it's are. true. You it's are. not like yeah. the old commercial for the dog that would come with a CD in his mouth and give it to the owner. He puts it in and plays it. Doesn't yeah. work like that. Didn't right. work like that with CDs either. But anyway. I know. But I'm 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 amazed that you could actually. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think back to when I was an obsessive, t like I must have played the Ziggy Stardust album mm -hmm. five times a day for three years. And the and Spiders of Mars. Out, you know? Yeah. So, wow. And you were still doing Chase when you uh, were preparing to write Hellbound, right? You were still in the in the band Chase. Um, no, the Chase was actually. We oh no, we you might. Well, it, it's going back a while, right? No, you're, you're right. It, this is just, it, it's sad because I guess we hadn't officially ceased to perform. Right. Um, but by 1986, we, I don't think technically we ever broke the band up. You know, mm -hmm. like I, we never had like a meeting and said, I guess it's over, lads. Hey, 2025 um, return of the chase. There you go. There you go. <laughs> This is you probably want to edit this out because it it's. I was in Liverpool uh, two months ago, th two oh. or three months ago, mm -hmm. for my niece's wedding, and I walked a couple of days after the wedding. I had one or two days left, so I saw Ramsey, for example, and uh, I saw my o oldest friend grew up on the same street together. Dave and I were walking into a pub middle of the afternoon in Liverpool. And I walk past this table and a guy says, Pete. And I looked around and I thought, oh, whose dad is this? Because it was an older gentleman. Uh -huh. And I had about five seconds and then he stood up and said, it's Mike. And <laughs> you know, the scales fell from my eyes and it was my bass player. It was my friend. Yeah. Wow. He'd been with me throughout, you know, for eight years. And the audacity, yeah, the audacity of me thinking, "Who's that?" Who's this dad? It's just because in my head, the last time I saw Mike, he was yeah thirty one, right? Or something, and he, and he still looked exactly like himself. He's a little gray, you know, yeah. had, a, had a grayer beard, but um, but Mike is one of those people who is 
very suspicious of social media and technology. So I've never been able to get in touch with him. He's not yeah. on Facebook. He's not on Twitter. He's he's nowhere to be found. And of course, the Liverpool landline phone number I had for him, you know, seems yeah, to be it's from thirty eight years ago. Yeah, <laughs> right. But the odds, well, I mean, Liverpool's not a huge city, but the odds of walking into a pub and like, boom, there he is. That was, it was great. Um, oh, I, I bet it was wonderful. So, I guess so, that was, so we, we officially broke up then. Three okay. Ago, and we said, uh, you know, we haven't scheduled a rehearsal for a while. So I yeah, guess, so. yeah, I get it. But, I get it. But that's but great yeah, but, that you, that you, you got a chance like, to go I back. Was, um, technically my, my, last artistic endeavor had been the chase prior to the invitation to right write right them. except i'd started writing fiction which you know as we said mm -hmm. how come chris fig could <laughs> could take the risk of hiring me that's right that's right one other thing i learned from that uh rat slice sound feature read about chris young was that it, what inspired him to get into music was uh bernard herman soundtracks one day he went into yeah jack's uh, uh record store and he uh he, he he started listening to bernard herman and i guess that kind of opened up his mind to the movie scores and uh you know how 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 much they add to a movie and how much right. uh he he got into that stuff because yeah. he'd been a drummer i believe if i'm remembering i think so yeah. yeah um we have you actually, uh, we were not on disc four, but you did a commentary track for this edition for disc four for Bloodline, right. which we've talked a little bit about earlier, me and Ryan. But uh, so you, how did you get contacted for that? Was it Stephen? Yeah, yeah. Because um, Stephen Kim, as you say, had been doing all, had been contract, contracted to do all four. And I think because of, you know, the whole elaborate bloodline saga and the troubled production. Yeah. Um, they thought, well, let's actually get some horse's mouth in. And um, and also, I guess, because Steve had not been involved. He, you know, he'd been unit publicist on one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. So he himself had limited uh, horse's mouth knowledge. Stories. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that actually hadn't occurred to me. I just thought it was because. <laughs> because of the clusterfuck that uh, Bloodline was, they yeah. wanted me to come in. But it might simply have been that, that it was like a, a first-hand experience. Of course. Mm -hmm. Great to have yeah. someone uh, at the commentary track who could talk yeah. a little bit about that stuff. Um, got, I, I believe on on the Hellbound disc of, of, of Quartet... They they have imported older commentaries. I yes, did, I think. There, there's it's... one there's one from '96 and one from 2000 that you Do did. Do I contradict myself in both of them? I'm bloody I, sure. I I just watched the 2000 one. I didn't watch the one from '96 right. yet. I I know that there's a couple of things in the '96 and the 2000 commentaries. I think the '96 might have been. Was it when that beautiful uh, box came out with that one, two, and three? I was think it was a. Uh, Anchor oh, Bay he, or something? The one that was the puzzle box? Yeah, you remember yeah. that? It was the Anchor yeah. Bay edition uh, that came out. Yeah. Yes, I, I never physically saw that. Yeah. Uh, so I think that came out. No, that, I don't think that was 96. Because 96 no? would have been very first time DVDs yeah. were coming out. I think you're right. I think I'm talking. Yeah. I think the one that came out from Anchor Bay was like 2004 or something like that. Yeah. So you're probably right. That was probably... Um, you know, it's so weird, isn't it, to remember a life before uh, iPhones. When right. We didn't obsessively photograph every moment of our lives. So <laughs> right. I've only got, like all of us, you know, prior to, I don't know, 2010, mm -hmm. you might yeah. have three photos a year, and then you've got, you know, 17 a day. Um so I've only got a couple of photos, but I've posted them quite often on social media of me, Clive, and Ashley doing commentary, mm -hmm. um, which I'm sure you guys have seen. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I that, know, that's I the, know that's, that, the, I, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, I know that that, those photos are from 2003. There's one of me and Ashley on the couch, both mm -hmm. in headphones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's a very nice three shot of me, Clive and Ash. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I know that's from 2003. So my guess is that 
whatever you just said. But that 2004 release is probably what those photos are from. That's probably yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, I think and, so. And that the, was the one that they included was 2000 with you and Tony Randall and Ashley Lawrence. And I think, I, I, I think that was the same day. I think we did Hellraiser and Hellbound on the same day in a oh. in a fairly big studio. I mean, these days, obviously, you, you do your commentary from your house. But um, yeah, we went in and I acted as moderator for Clive and Ashley to talk about Hellraiser, and then and then I think Clive bailed, and me, Tony, and Ashley. Ah, well, was no wait was no I guess Tony wasn't there. Was oh, I the think room? I have I think I have a list of uh, of the extras on that. Let me just go to that stuff. On it says disc here two? that yeah, on disc two it says I, I listed them all on our show notes. Yeah, I'm um, looking at that right now. Oh, behind the scenes footage, lost in the labyrinth. Yeah, it doesn't specify who was in it, uh, but yeah, I think I think you're right. I think it was Tony is in at least two of those. I think, and then sure. I've definitely he, done commentary with Tony twice. Yeah. Twice, because there's one thing that Tony that is saying. It was only the three of us. It was only me, Clive, and Ash. Mm, yeah. That. Oh, maybe, maybe, probably. I, I, because obviously I had nothing to do with the first movie, but I, I moderated right. a conversation between those two, and right. then maybe Clive left and Tony came in. That could be it. Yeah, Tony but those did. those old uh, commentary tracks are also chock full of stuff. I mean, the one with Kim Newman and Stephen Jones in this um, right. second uh, disc for Hellbound, it's so good because Stephen is like a fountain of knowledge about everything Hellraiser. Mm -hmm. He's 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 got everything. He's like, we got to get him on the show. We got to get him on the podcast <laughs> yeah. at some point because we've yeah. been we've been doing this A through Z of horror uh, commentary track series because of the movies that they mention in the A through Z of horror, and I I just think it's great because. Every time I see uh, interviews with Stephen Jones and, and every time I see him in anything, he's just he's a great conversationalist. So uh, probably after yeah. you, we're going to have to try to get him and maybe Christopher <laughs> yeah. Fig to come yeah. in. But uh, those commentaries are super yeah, interesting. I mean, I mean, you know, obviously I can put you guys in. Uh, do you have contact for Steve? Uh, yeah, uh, I yeah. think he's on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, he's definitely on we, Facebook. We just yeah, haven't really ha we haven't we haven't talked to him yet. Right. Um, yeah. But some of those um, extras on the DVD, like, for example, Being Frank with Sean Chapman is something that uh, I had never seen many interviews with Sean Chapman. I mean, I don't think there were any at all. Yeah. I mean, this is, might be the first one that's on a Hellraiser uh, release was when they put this on the uh, uh, when they came out with a surgeon scene and uh, the yeah. chatter and the elevator and all that stuff. Right. That's when they shot right. the this this new material with Sean Chapman. So it seems like he um he is he's a great bloke, but it seems like yeah. he didn't have much of a, an experience in the on set with Hellbound because I guess he only worked a couple of days or something like that. But uh, and, and and they've got a special feature of Doug Bradley saying the surgeon scene was never filmed, and then there's an extra of the filming of the surgeon scene. <laughs> That's right. I That's don't right. know why he thought that. He's he's said <laughs> yeah. that a couple of times. Yeah. Uh, I, I think he was just tired of talking, of getting questions about it. So well, eventually, I, mean, I was tired of it too. I, I was tired of explaining that it was crap. It was like because uh, <laughs> the huge mistake was in New World's marketing. They put a still from it on the back of mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think the VHS box, the very yeah. first VHS uh, uh, release. Yeah, and you know, it's an intriguing image, of course, for sure. Head and the female Cenobite in surgeon's gowns. Yeah. Um, and so this this myth grew up that it was like it was the sense of the scene that was too strong for the movie. And oh, <laughs> we, we hope we could see the surgeons of God scene. And every time somebody asked me about it, I would say they would say, "Why was it cut? Was it?" And I say, "No, it was cut because it was crap. It was terrible. Um, <laughs> it was it was just it was badly scheduled." Um, and I think that, like they tried to get the whole sequence done in half an afternoon and it just it just you know it didn't work it wasn't good so yeah. like many things that don't work and aren't good you chop it out um 
like getting rid of a cancerous growth for the sake of the whole body. <laughs> right. Uh, and the movie was definitely better with that. I mean, I don't think I don't think Doug or Barbie performed it badly. Um, but it was just I think it was it was rushed and it was not good. Um, yeah. So yeah, maybe maybe Doug's response to the you're right, Joe. Maybe he just thought, I'm just going to pretend it didn't happen. Yeah, yeah. But, but uh, one thing was, that one thing that came up in the in the commentaries was that uh, Tony Randall said that that there was an addi- a, another uh, director first that kind of bailed, and then they uh, and then he he said, well, I'd like to do it. So do you know who that director was? Yeah, no, of course. Yeah, it was. Um, he didn't well bail <laughs> that's a strange choice of, of words for um i don't know well i I, I think i was paraphrasing maybe that was probably not okay, the right sure. word yeah yes nobody it wasn't um it was a guy it was the guy who wrote beetlejuice it was a guy called michael mcdowell uh, oh. who was a great horror novelist as well uh a uh, great fictioneer um he had been he was there was no contract uh and nothing was written and but he was going to chris and clive had spoken to michael about writing and directing hellraiser 2 this is way back in 87 Mm -hmm. maybe even 86 Mm -hmm. um and it wasn't that uh well i'm not there's no i'm not telling tales out of school because M- michael himself sadly died f- four or five years ago i i'm not quite sure what had happened was um michael's partner or or hus- well i guess she couldn't be a husband back then but his mm-hmm. his life partner um was seriously ill became seriously mm. ill and so he said, you know, I, so I guess he bailed at that point. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't have said it that no, way. No, I was no. just trying to <laughs> No, I'm be not quick. pointing the finger at you, Ryan, at yeah. all. Though if, if Tony said it, he should have been a little more. No, I don't think so. I don't think he did. I think that was that. just, yeah, um, my was, faulty memory. Sure. But yes, it was true. The, um, God, it's, uh, neither Tony nor I might have got our shot mm. um if of course if michael had done it because you know he was he was a hot property having written beetlejuice um, right so that was you know that was personally very sad for for him and his partner um that's interesting i'm uh yeah this was an, it would uh, have been a completely different hellraiser too yeah it would have been completely different oh, yeah, but yeah that's what i yeah. mean there was no um there was no, it wasn't like there was a story knocking round that he would have worked on and that ended up being the one yeah. we, Tony and I worked on. Right. Um, it, it was all in pre-production, so you guys didn't even no have. No one near pre-production. No one near, okay. Uh, Not even yeah. a treatment or anything like that. Right. There, and and yeah. no contracts. So nothing was. I mean, Speak. I, you know, for all I know, he and Clive might have had a drink um sure said, let's make it a musical um, yeah <laughs> or whatever um, <laughs> but no n- nothing i uh it's funny that you mentioned that uh we could have had a very different hell hellbound or hellraiser 2 hellbound mm-hmm. um because we had a much more different film in one of your first drafts of this where we had like chenard who you named after i think the first doctor who uh performed a successful heart transplant barnard uh, well, I originally was Malahide, right? Malahide. I called him Malahide. Yeah. Uh, I I have grown to love the name Chenard over the uh-huh. years because sure. I associate it with Ken's performance and the fans love him. Um, but I. It was it's really funny that Tony and I ended up best friends and are still best friends to this day, because the very first conversation I had with him on the phone um we'd never met and also i was i was a little pre-suspicious because you know i knew he'd been a suit i knew he'd been a development executive um and so i was in one london hotel and i guess he'd just arrived and had checked into his hotel and we spoke on the phone and we arranged to meet later that day 
and he said, um, I read your script. He was very complimentary about the script. And then he said, oh, yeah, and this this mad doctor, I, I, I like him too. Malahide. Yeah, it's a great name. I'm going to change it. Who the hell do you think you're like you son of a bitch yeah right it's a great name i'm gonna change it right and then and then i met him later and we got on fine but um he explained to me that he wanted to call him chenard and i said i I like the sound of it why and he said and he explained to me that there was a person who'd once performed the first and i said ah there it is thanks for clearing that up yeah yeah and but this is this is what bothered me and still bothers me. And I still give him shit about it till today. He said, so I took the first letters of his first name and the and then the end of his second name. So it's Chenard. And I said, but it's not Christopher, is it? Right. <laughs> so you should call him Cranard if you want to do that. There you go. Um and he said, No, no, but it's spelt with an H. And I, I'm like, yeah, it's spelt with a fucking H, but it's not pronounced with an H. Right, right. Um, and then, and I don't, I, I've told this before as a joke. I don't think it's actually, see, the problem is you make a joke and then it sort of becomes enshrined in the mythology. Right. Um, like you're angry or I, something. Right. I, yeah. I have claimed in the past that he then said, oh, well, are you saying we should call him Cronard? <laughs> and I said, no, you fucking idiot. That sounds terrible. Of course, call him Chenard. I'm just, but I, I don't think he said that. Obviously, we were never going to call him Chenard. Yeah. But I called him Malahide um, just as, as a complete ripoff of Dollarhide. Oh. So Francis Dollarhide from uh, Sans. The, wait, is it Red Dragon? or Sans Red, Sans? Uh, Yeah, Red Dragon. Red Dragon, uh, right. Yeah, Harris um, uh, novel. Because yeah. I realized Dollarhide meant if you take the the tiniest sense of latin and then slang um dollar hide means sad skin oh. uh, and so i thought well malahide would be bad skin yeah. right that was, that's that's what i was getting out of it malahide right. i was like skinless people malahide yeah. i wonder if he was working that angle into it as like that, well, there was a British actor called Patrick Malahide, so it was a real name. So I was right, aware right. of the name, mm -hmm. but um, but I was also very aware of Red Dragon, and um, and when I thought about Dollarhide as a, this is way too inside baseball and chatty. You know? Oh, that's great stuff, though. It's great yeah. stuff. But, um, but yeah, so that that's why I had called him Malahide, and then that's why Tony wanted him to be Chenard because of a heart transplant. Still gotcha. makes no fucking sense to me <laughs> right? to this day, but he he is Chenard, and we'll always... to this. I, I'm going to start calling him Quinard from now on. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh, on the um, on the the oh gosh, what are those called? The sketches that you know lay out the scenes. Why can't the storyboards? The storyboards. Yeah, uh, Malahide or or Chenard was drawn like a, a tall, thin guy with dark hair and glasses. He looked totally different from Ken Cranham. Well, it's kind of an interesting conception at, at that stage. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think you might have been seeing the uh, storyboards made by Mike Plug, I think. Or was that for Hellraiser 3? Uh, Mike did Hellraiser 3. 3. Well, d didn't yeah. do the Hellraiser That's right. 3 that we made. Right. The the image galleries have a whole bunch of a uh, whole bunch of images of the storyboards. Oh yeah, this yeah. disc. Well, yeah. Well, I'm trying to think. It would have been if, this, if these are from Hellbound. It would be by uh, John Floyd, I think. Uh, not John. Oh, Floyd. Okay. Floyd Hughes. I'm sorry. Floyd Hughes. Okay. It's this weird crossover of Floyd. <laughs> yeah. It was Floyd Hughes and John Floyd. John Floyd. What are we looking at here? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think those fellows have been drinking. I know. <laughs> I just sorry. I had to interrupt because I just I was yeah. just going through this, and this is uh, another part. And I apologize for some Hellraiser fans. I'm going to be showing a picture of Lawrence Coop in here. But oh, <laughs> yeah. my God, he looks young. But anyway, so um, funny. here it says that you guys were already working five versions of Hellraiser 3. And I know a few of those. Uh, yeah. uh, like there was an Egyptian idea where the, the yeah, yeah. Lament configuration was going to be the key that opens the, the Pharaoh pyramid or something. Right. And, and then the, eventually. And the. Um, and the, the uh 
the brothel one, right? The brothel with the priest. That well, would that, have that been a wild thing. That, was, that actually genuinely went into development. The, the yeah. Room, I mean, I'm sure you... Uh, you guys we were robbed. That article I wrote, right? We did, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, yeah so dissecting the beast, the beast in stages. stages. Yeah. yeah, right. So there's at least there were at least six uh, wow. potential <laughs> Hellraiser yeah. crews yeah. due to the rights changing hands and companies going out of business and whatever. The brothel one, Pinhead's Bordello, um, that was the one that was actually had gone. That that's what Mike Klug did uh, storyboards for. Yeah, uh, because I wrote. New World had, yeah, right. New World went bankrupt while we were in pre production on that version of Hellraiser 3. But they had commissioned everything, all those other versions that I uh, give synopses of in that article. Uh, none of them went to script stage. Several of them went to treatment stage, mm -hmm. and a couple of them right. were just entirely verbal. Um, uh, but that one went to at least two, if not three, um, drafts of a script. And then New World went bankrupt and we all went home. We were at Pinewood. Mike Plug was doing storyboards. Image animation was starting to prep some of yeah. things. And then... That one was wild. We we read we read uh, one of those drafts and, and talked about it on the podcast. It would and, have and, taken Hellraiser in an exciting new direction. Yeah. It would totally P almost like Pinhead had like, had like Pinhead. an insect carapace, right? For uh, instead of the leather, well, like an armor like, kind of yeah, like clothing. I, can't, I, can't yeah, I don't know. It's just it was great. I love the idea of having the actual uh, ha uh, box builder Chenard be this blind guy that's still alive. Oh, uh, Le and Marchand. He, Le Marchand, exactly. Yeah. And he would control. The house itself would be a little configuration on his hand, and he could like switch it and stuff. If if our listeners who are listening to this, if you've never found this screenplay, you got to read it, and it's wild, it's crazy. It's called Hellraiser Three. What was the name? What was the title of it? I forgot. Anyway, it was always every version was going to be called Hello. We always had Hell on Earth. Yeah, right, right, right. Um, so as as with Hellbound. Um, we we started with the, we we always knew what the title was going to be, um, so yeah, that one, and that has a that has a protagonist or or a my yeah it was character called Saltscaber in it right it it does I think was that based on Eric Saltscaber yeah right it was my pal yeah. 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 Well, you know, he'd put he'd named a Cenobite in the comics Atkins. Atkins, yeah, so yeah, the guy right. with the guns and stuff, the Rambo right. kind of guy. Yeah, so the craziest to... Cenobite. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I needed to repay the uh -oh. favor. So I oh yeah, in in that movie. So and now Bart, most, yeah, he was the most upset when that movie tanked. When that version, yeah. oh was yeah, like, oh. I was... I was going to get my name on the screen. I know there, there was a fan theory that uh, that they that and in this long um, this long feature the the um, hell was what they wanted. There was a fan yeah. theory that they mentioned that uh, that when people are in hell, the time is moving really slowly, and that Julia had lots of time to become like this queen of hell, even though only oh. like hours or maybe a day had gone by in the real world. I mean, is that did did you have anything like that in mind? Of course. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, you're giving you're giving me and all of us way too much credit about to to think things through like that. Um, I, yeah, I guess it was just hours later. Yeah, yeah, or maybe it, a day. It, yes, I mean, if yeah, it maybe because Kirsty might have gone relative. to sleep and woken um, up, right? Yeah. People forget that uh, Julia went through orientation in hell, so they uh, they had a little mm -hmm. table with a vid VCR set up for. Uh, <laughs> this is yeah. what you're going to be yeah, now. And Leviathan said, "Well, let me ask you, where do you see yourself five years from now?" <laughs> five years from now, that's right. <laughs> what would you say your greatest weaknesses yeah. are? Why should we yeah. hire you for this position? Yeah. Right. No, but but I think I thought Julia's part in the movie was amazing because it it, it um, she wasn't like Frank at all, and when she's coming back. She doesn't care if Shenard opens the box, right? And if you're watching this movie, you're thinking, and you've seen the first movie, you're thinking, 
wait a minute, she should run, right? The Cenobites are coming. They're going to come get her. She's escaping. But it turns out it was all a kind of a ploy by Leviathan to get to get more people in, and she's working for him. Right. It. Right. I guess Leviathan, I don't know, is not a him. I don't know. Let, let's not misgender <laughs> them, yeah. Brian. You know, That's I right. don't know. Who are yeah. we to... Uh, <laughs> That's right. I, I think if ever there was a they, it would certainly be Leviathan. So, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So perhaps we should, in fact, give them... Uh, <laughs> but yeah. what what a crazy ride the second draft of Hellbound was because in this story we'd see Kirsty actually wanting to go into hell to rescue her dad, uh, Larry, who would right, be yeah. uh, taken by the Cenobites. But we assume it was taken well, after Frank killed him and skinned him. Right? The Cenobites yeah, came and why th this? It, you put your finger on something interesting, Joe. Um, yeah. Yeah, we. I'm, I want to be very careful with the. I was about <laughs> the problem with my loose tongue is I was say we were stuck with Larry, which is a ridiculous thing because and Andy Robinson is a fantastic actor. Yeah, so I don't mean in any way, um, mm -hmm. but but it's a problematic what concept. What actually happened yeah. pragmatically was that yeah. we were. I wrote the first two drafts, three drafts, in fact. We were all under the collective assumption that Andy would be coming back, that he was going to be one of the returning cast. Um, and then we suddenly heard that he wasn't, that they, um, well, they, I don't know what I can say in context. I think New World just, just went real cheap. Um, yeah. But he it's he has said in an interview say, that I mean, I, that you know, he didn't I, I get never, he wanted to get paid met. the same amount as the first movie. Oh, okay, so he as he yeah. said that in public. Okay, then I'm yeah. telling tales out of school. Yeah, I'd never met Andrew until uh, I did the Vegas show a year and a half ago, um, and he was great. It was fantastic to meet him. He was a lovely guy, um, and yeah, he he told me then that what happened was. They in New World, not not Chris mm -hmm. and Clive. They very much wanted him, mm -hmm. um, and knew he was worth every penny. But yeah, New World apparently asked him to come back, and then even though it was a bigger budget, even though we were shooting at Pinewood, this is according to Andrew, they wanted him to come back, and they offered him not a raise, not even the same. They wanted him to come back for less money. Yeah, than they paid him on the first one. So his agent said you can't do you know you can't let them fuck around with your quote like that because that yeah. so he 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 couldn't do it so pragmatic I, I just didn't know if i could tell that story but i guess if andrew has well and said and it, for well, for americans in the first hellraiser right he was the i mean he's the star that everybody recognized the only name right uh, yeah well, scorpio yeah, in the uk ken yeah. ken had had a tv show called um shine on harvey moon which, which he was great in um but yeah, uh, Andrew Andrew was the Scorpio killer, right? He was yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then around '98, I think he was playing Liberace in a in a TV movie, right. and then he got into oh, right. American Playhouse, which was a TV series. So he he kept himself busy through 1998 yeah. as well, in '97 and '87. Oh yeah. Uh, no, but he was gonna be so. The draft that I read was, Kirsty sees the skin body writing "I'm in hell." Right help me and she would be like i gotta go to hell to my rescue dad. my dad right. and then she would go in there and there would be this weird sequence where there'd be a frank and larry would be stitched together like siamese twins i believe right. and yeah, there yeah. would be and, and and they ripped themselves apart and they thought well, here's the thing though um especially now that i know new world you know were assholes to, mm -hmm. to Andrew, it's it's terrible that that happened, but I have to say that um, I'm surprised. They, I I know I've said this on some interviews. I'm surprised I haven't had the conversation with you guys because you know you're the Ur manuscript of of Hellraiser. Oh, thanks. Uh, critical <laughs> studies. Um, <laughs> my the only disagreement Clive and I had because I know I bored you with the story. We came up with the story overnight. We had a bottle of whiskey. By the next morning, we had. The well, plot. it's not boring, but. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. but I've told it several times. Your, your Liverpool accent came um, out so strong when you said that. <laughs> but, um, but the the only lingering disagreement we had there was uh, that Larry was in hell. And from the get-go, I had always said, why is Larry in hell? Yeah. What has he done to deserve yeah. this? Mm. He, in Judeo-Christian morality standards, he didn't sin. So, he did, you know, he hasn't gone to hell yeah. the old way. But they, right. they tried to take Kirsty too, in the first right. movie, and, and she didn't, didn't do anything box. either. Well, she but, did yeah. open the box. Right. She, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Larry... There, Larry should not be in hell. Larry should mm -hmm. never have been in hell. Mm -hmm. And so, but yeah, we did come up with the, all, the, all, all those elaborate brother versus brother. Yeah. Um, there was more skin swapping like in. Yeah. Right. There was a knife room and they would cut each other like, and that would lead into the uh, surgeon scene because she would come back with Larry bleeding Correct. out. Right. Because he's been separated yes. from his brother. And what a hell that should be be stitched to your brother when they're so different. Larry and Frank, they're just yeah, yeah. complete opposite. So, and that's when for our listeners who are following this story, that's when she would come out of the corridor of hell with, with Larry and she'd be coming out into a hospital and she'd be like, Oh, my dad needs help. And then that would be like, Oh no, his artery has been sliced and he's going to bleed to death. And then the doctor would turn into the uh, pinhead scene, the surgeons with a Cenobite and, because the female Cenobite and Chatter chases them onto the uh, elevator. And then right. I think and they would also see, cut off. and they would also see the engineer picking up a, yeah, yeah it was, it was, it, uh, it, it was going to be really sequence. different, right? It was a bit of fine sequence. It was, I guess it's just, I don't know back then how image animation would be able to work out some of these effects. Like, the oh, surgeon scene. Do it? Are you kidding? Those I, guys yeah, are I mean, they, they, would, they would, they would have made something work, yeah. but uh but that would have been was, very different. Weirdly, what ended up the surgery that was necessary was not on Larry, but on Larry's absence, because we suddenly heard after three drafts mm. um, that we wouldn't have Andrew. Right. And and I got to admit, I was the only person who thought, right, thank God. <laughs> um, because I just, what so, rules are there? If Larry's in yeah. hell, there are no rules. It's ridiculous. So. Yeah. Although I then had, I think, because this was literally, I'm making this figure up, but it was like, you know, 10 days before we went into hard prep, right. uh, pretty, like legit pre-production. Mm -hmm. um, so I had to do a whole draft without a major through line character. Um, but I was really happy to do it because it was like, no, of course, it's always been Frank just fucking with Kirsty. Right. Because yeah. Because... He's in hell as he fucking deserves to be. Yeah. And Larry is just quietly in heaven. Yeah. Or the void, depending upon one's personal. Belief. Sure. I could see that. I yeah. mean, I understand that being the writer, you have this internal logic you want to make sense of. Um, and they I, never understand, Joe. Those yeah. other fuckers, they don't get that. Oh, out. you got to cut this page. It's like, get this page, then this is not going to pay explains off. explains the entire motivation right. for yeah. yeah. Right. But uh, but what a what a wild ride that would have been if we had seen uh, uh, Larry you and know, Frank and been great I yeah mean, I'm I, sure and I'm sure that and this is not a judgment call on the audience um, I'm sure the audience wouldn't have hopefully you know we made a good enough movie mm -hmm. move fast enough the audience wouldn't stop to think what had Larry ever done to be in hell so I, I didn't I guess I really was well. Being, uh, well yeah, but I, I think that, you know, people it. like us later on would have been That's talking about say. that. Yeah. But, right, yeah, right. 30 years later, yeah, we would all be being hauled over the coals now. <laughs> I know. How it's could like, you yeah. be so dumb? I yeah, how come, how come the boyfriend it. Steve wasn't in hell? He got punched by the engineer in Hellraiser. Oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know. <laughs> there's, a, there's a little room down the 41st corridor. And it's yeah. Just, and you well you didn't put in a backstory of how uh, how Butterball got back to hell because he didn't get sent by the box. He just had a girder or a, a, a beam fall on his head. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that's oh, great. Details, details. <laughs> this is where um, that 
hell is what they wanted that that thing with Kit Power and George? Uh, that's yeah. where the fans come in and they start talking about. Oh, I have a theory that uh, maybe Julia spends more time in hell than yeah, that, actually yeah, that hell past. is different. It, it's, that's yeah. the beauty of it, right? That's when we, you know, fans just throw their brains at this stuff and they try to make sense of every little detail that is completely yeah. meaningless to anybody else except them. Oh, sure. It's, I know, but but that is half the fun. I agree. Uh, I nearly went down a rabbit hole yesterday, actually. It was funny because I, I mean, I'm, sh I'm sure you guys check in with and maybe even post on uh, the Hellbound web. Mm -hmm. Yes. Page. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, it, it's Esther. Yeah, right, right. Mullings, Esther. I think. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Mark Adams. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, I think it was always Mark's. Was it yeah, he, he website, right? It yeah, he the... he got the website from the original guy who made it back in like 2002. That's a there's a weird story about the Hellbound Web. Like at, at one point, it ended up in in the news because uh, uh, someone hacked into the website and created a Al Qaeda website inside of the Hellbound Web in oh. 2002. And then uh, the guy who had the website you know, eventually said, okay, this was, this was fun, but I'm really a phantasm kind of guy. So I'm going to give this site to whoever wants it. And at the time, Mark Adams was a moderator for the forum and he ended up getting access to the site. So he, he did a great job with it from then on. Sure. And uh, sure. yeah, so that was, that was how it started. I remember going on that website for me, you were talking about cell phones for me, the big change in how I processed information was before the internet and after having access to the internet, which happened around 94. And that's when I started going on the internet and I started looking for what happens if I search for Hellraiser. And it's like this right. web. You and look at all these people. Oh, did I just lose you, my? You did mute. Yeah. Oh, yeah. right, right. I apologize for that. Am I back? The mute button, but yeah. Oh, yeah. It was only it just like five school. seconds. Yeah. The, yeah. Right. Thank you. So I was like, the first time I searched on the internet for Hellraiser, I found that website. And I was like, look at all this cool stuff. Storyboards, pictures, you know, people talking about the movie. That's the, that's my community. That's That's where I really kind of went in there and found out all these scripts and all that stuff. Oh, and that was, was a beautiful amazed. resource. I was amazed at how many, you know, various drafts of various scripts they <laughs> uh, they'd managed yeah. they'd managed to illegally accumulate. <laughs> yeah. But I but I remember that there was a bone of contention for Hellbound was that Frank was not supposed to be in Hell, and people would spend hours typing their comments and proof of you well, mean he Larry. shouldn't be. Larry, yes, yeah, 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 right. Sorry, uh, and it's like well, I'm, people... I'm with him. Larry, Larry should never have been in hell. But sure. what I was going to say, but I do, but I love, like, like you're saying, it, it's it's fantastic that, mm -hmm. and you know, having grown up as a comic book fan and a Doctor Who fan as a little kid and a teenager, the obsessive attention to, to detail, which far outstrips the attention to detail of the creators, nearly always, you know. Um, but I, I, I love and I'm moved by the fact that people do this. Um, and that's what I was going to say. I nearly went down a rabbit hole. Was it yesterday? It might even have literally been this morning, but I knew I had to mm. meet you guys. Somebody somebody has started a thread on the Hellband Web Facebook about Angelique mm. and the diff oh. Oh, he who summons the magic commands the magic. The line right, the right. Oh, yeah. And so there's a there's, there's a very healthy debate going on in there right now about how come the rules don't seem to apply to the Cenobites. And and uh -huh. I was so tempted to go in and say, well, Angelique is a true daughter of hell. She's a demon. She predates the Cenobites. She commissioned the fucking box. There were no right. none of those rules apply. And then I thought. No, just let them talk. It's like, <laughs> oh yeah, it's they'll get there. They'll get there. To, uh, because I yeah. think because you know if I come in there and mouth off, there's some kind of oh well I guess you know if the guy who wrote the movie says this and I didn't want to stifle because people exactly as you're saying they have these incredibly elaborate theories and explanations. Yeah, and I thought, well, who am I to? Uh, to go in and tell them that no, that's wrong because uh, authorial intent 
while a factor mm -hmm. is is not the only factor in in mm -hmm. discussions about what things mean um, and i think what i love about hellraiser 2 also is that it answered some questions about what hell is like but it also created a whole bunch of more questions i mean you when true. you see leviathan you think how can that thing be a you know a creature or a god and, How can and, it even float? And, What's keeping yeah, it up there? Yeah, and well, and and uh, and just a small detail in Shenard's room, him having three puzzle boxes, that that blows up a whole bunch of stuff. Like, whoa, that's not what I, you know, I thought that this there was only one, you know. But well, you can right. be a collector and have a bunch of these things. Yeah, that's well, what yeah, opens again, up. Again, yeah. there are. I'm sure there are more fan theories than I know of, mm -hmm. but I know mm -hmm. that like. The, the the two easy outs are, well, he was looking for the real one. There have been fakes over the years. Oh. And, you know, he's obsessively collected the fakes until he found the real one and gave it to Tiffany. Oh. But let me assure you, that did not occur to me. I just thought it would be cool to have three bell jars yeah. boxes. And I also, if pressed, I would argue that once the box was not that I'd thought up Angelique yet. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But once the box had been commissioned, um, well, why wouldn't help put them into production? You know, it's like yeah. get as many people yeah. as you can. Right, so, right. So I think in my head it was, again, you think a lot more simply than, than the fans are going to yeah. spend time thinking about it. I just assumed, yeah, there probably been several of these things because yeah. – you know, the mechanism must be replicable. Right. So, but yes, we we let it drop after that. I still love that shot, though, of Bill Hope. You know, it's a nice black and white still. Yeah. Of Bill Hope, who played Kyle, leaning over the three bell jars because it looks like it looks like it's from a 1930s movie to me. Yeah. It's like, Jesus, he must have been in this for years. Was, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right, I just, but I, but I yeah. think the the easy out, and I I might have been guilty of saying this in previous. Like like Doug says, we never shot the surgeons of God. My oh, this will shut him up. Uh, get out of jail free card was just well, series of fakes, you know, until he found. Oh, the woman sure, the sure. Fakes, that but. that uh, that's exciting to think about that. I mean, it's like the death of the author. Author, it's like when when they say that uh, you know. That the meaning of a text is not necessarily described by the author's intent, but by the reader's interpretation. Uh, sometimes. Sure. Oh, yeah, I completely agree with that. Yeah, sometimes. I, mean, I, I think it's worth, like I say, it's a factor. I think it's worth having authorial intent in the mix. Yeah. But, um, and, I, and I don't think, because especially in these days of alternative facts and trutherism and all uh -huh. that shit, um, we also, we can't necessarily give credence to, hey, man, whatever you think happened is your truth. It's like if the fan theories or, or high-end critical theories are good and useful and informative and encourage more conversation, great. If they're dumb as fuck, <laughs> we should, you know, we should all be free to say, no, that's just stupid. It can't possibly be that because <laughs> X, but yeah. then, but it's part of the conversation. The I, I, I'm sure well-read fellows like yourself. You remember the one of the giants of the golden age of science fiction, Isaac Asimov. Sure, um, he tells a self-deprecating story. Uh, it's in one of the intros to one of his books. I read it fifty years ago. I can't remember where it is, but he he went and attended. He was a he was an established author, but not yet a sort of superstar in the field. But he'd sold several stories to the pulps and the digests. And he went in to some creative writing lecture somewhere. And he heard, he claims completely by accident, that wasn't why he went, but the lecturer started talking about one of his stories and explained what the story meant. And Asimov very smugly stood up during the Q&A part of the session and said, 
Uh, well, so 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 so, sir, I um, I think you'll find that that's really not uh, the meaning of that story at all. And the lecturer said, "What and what makes you say that?" And Asimov says again, self-deprecatingly, "I played my trump card." Period. I smiled at him and said, "Because, sir, you see, I am the author of that story." And then the next <laughs> paragraph is. He didn't miss a beat. He looked at me and said, and just because you wrote it, what makes you think you know the first thing about it? <laughs> I sat down, crushed. Yeah. Um, I mean, and, it, and, yeah. and he's right. I mean, I, I don't know if the lecturer was was that sharp and confident enough to have done it as neatly as yeah. Asimov told the story later. Yeah. But it is true. It's like, yeah, authorial intent is a big part mm -hmm. of... But any author, screenwriter or prose fiction or any other medium will tell you that so much of it is an unconscious process, it is an organic mm -hmm. and unconscious process that you don't know any better than anybody else until later. I'll, I'll very often look at something and say, oh, look at that. And you'll see a match. You'll see that, you know, something in the structure of the story matches a theme or whatever you, you'll spot yeah. things later that the universe or your unconscious clearly right. kind of put there because the pattern is there to be seen but it was absolutely not conscious and um most authors will admit that <laughs> you know that it's yeah. like yeah i didn't know that was there at the time but i i guess my subconscious was doing the work for me well, and, That's and right, I, yeah. I love the mystery and, and something Jose and I have talked about in a bunch of episodes is that about Hellraiser is that, you know, it seemed like such a missed opportunity for future sequels to not return to the labyrinth and Leviathan. I mean, it, it just exactly. with all of these sequels that happened, you know, none of them except for this Hulu movie, uh, right. none of them have that. Well, it's, there's 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 a depressingly pragmatic reason for that, Ryan, and that is <laughs> less money. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it all comes yeah, down to that. Hellraiser yeah. three had a smaller budget than Hellraiser two, oh. but we were shooting in North Carolina, so we mm -hmm. saved a little money. Um, Bloodline. Well, I mean, Miramax lied so fucking much about what the the actual budget was that who knows. Yeah. But certainly once they went uh, DTV, direct to video, they couldn't. I mean, I guess if they'd yeah. waited long enough for CGI, they could have they could have faked a labyrinth. But or, they yeah, or just do uh, just do a quick matte painting or something. Oh well, sure. Well, they, yeah. You know, or call Cliff Cully. Mm -hmm. who, you know, is in his 90s but is still alive, call Cliff Collins and say, have you got that glass shot of, of yeah. Labyrinth? Can we borrow it? Um, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it was, you know, those those direct-to-video sequels were very low-budget movies. And, yeah. Um, and the Hulu one, you know, at least had a bit of a budget, so they could... Yeah. Um, well, and I think also, you know, clearly the writers and director of... Um, of the Hulu one, um, are into the mythology in a, in a way that some of the yeah. guys who've made. And a little birdie has told me that uh, some more stuff might be on the way, so we'll we'll hold I, off I, on. I heard that in the last yeah. year or so. Yeah, I don't yeah. Know. That there'll be a There's sequel to the Hulu movie. Never know how well those yes. movies do with the streamers, yeah. right? Right. So, right. Like you, you, we all could have made an educated guess if the Hulu movie had been mm -hmm. theatrical or even strictly a, a you know an old school physical release uh, on uh, DVD or Blu-ray, we could all make an educated guess because we'd see how well it did. Yeah. And we'd say, oh, yes, we won't be seeing a sequel to that, or oh, this right. is a rebirth of the franchise. Right. With the streamers, and this yeah. is partly what last year's strike was about. Mm -hmm. They don't tell us anything. We, you know, we we don't know how well something does. Yeah, right. Because residuals equal. You yeah. then think, oh, I guess it must have done okay. You know. Well, and I think Hulu might be on their way out as an independent streamer. There's there's so many because right? you now now they make it um, 
So there's all the Disney Plus plans have options to include all mm. the Hulu stuff. And to me, that makes it seem like they're trying to shut down the the Hulu independently, you know, to to just merge it all together. Maybe. I think there are too many yeah. streamers and they're probably all going to start dropping off after a while. Well, yeah, there'll be some consolidation. And, yeah. yeah. And we'll be the ones who suffer, no doubt. Eventually, yeah. we'll be one nation under Disney. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, there'll uh, be Disney versus Discovery, right? It'll, sure. It'll, yeah. And the audacity of the prices they charge kills me. I know. It's ridiculous. They've just been hiking it up more now. I just got an email the other day yeah. saying, oh, we're going to be hiking up your YouTube TV or your Netflix or whatever. Right. It's like, okay, I guess I have a decision to make. But uh, Yeah, and... I looked at Netflix and I, I said, you know what? I have 4K TV and I have never looked at it. Do they have 4K plans? And I went and looked at Netflix and it was over $20 you if you wanted yeah. it in 4K. Yeah. But guess what? Now you can have <laughs> now you can have the, the four first Hellraiser movies in 4K Ultra HD with fresh content recorded by Peter Atkins on the fourth disc, for example, all this fresh content that was recorded for all four movies by Kim Newman and uh, Stephen Jones and all the people who did like Sorka, Sorka Line did a great yeah, feature right. for this one. Now she's working with another student who's doing a, 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 doc, a PhD thesis on Clive Barker. Oh, and, and, yeah. 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 Oh, and you've had both of them on the show. Right? We did. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we did. We were talking about the first uh, disc and we brought them in. So that was fun. So this is to me is like, this is the definitive vis uh, version right now. I think, I think at some point you've had enough audio commentary tracks for a movie and there's not much else you can say. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I mean, we'll put it this way. If um, audio commentary tracks, sure. I mean, every general, and let, let's, you know, so let's not talk specifically just about the Hellraiser mm -hmm. mythology or mythos, but um, I think every generation might well produce a scholar or two who has a scintillating new insight or take on on any yeah. existing mythology. I mean, Shakespeare hasn't run out of scholars yet. Lovecraft <laughs> right. hasn't run out of scholars yet. Yeah. So um, I think, you know, the debates are the enjoyment of the discussion of the merits and demerits of any, you know, franchise, to use the commercial word, or mythos, to use the pretentious word, I think will continue. But yet, in terms of wheeling us all out to, to give commentary on, oh, yeah, we shot this on a Tuesday afternoon. I remember because my lumbago was playing up. It's like, yeah, that's, <laughs> we're probably... Uh, Probably done with oh, that. Wow. And th it is a great package, Joe. You're right. And mm -hmm. it's really nice for us OGs to yeah. see um, all those younger people coming in. Because I mean, most of the extras on the new extras on this package, as you just said, are not people my age, either who were in yeah. the or were around at the time. They're these younger horror, like, you know, Paula de Ash and Eric LaRocca are on mm -hmm. another one. And you've you mentioned Carmel and Sorka and uh, Guy does stuff. And who oh, this one Kit and George, yeah. all these people yeah. you're talking about. It's it's lovely that they pop up and, and, and want to talk about this. Yeah, 35 I think that I and I yeah. And I think the, the kit power and george daniel leah one one of them said like i was i was born in 1985 so obviously i didn't see hellraiser in the theater yeah right. yeah right. but what a great package uh hellbound hellraiser to me they're just one movie and uh, i like to watch them back to back yeah. and uh thank you so much for joining us today to talk a little yeah. bit more about oh, my pleasure joe it's always great to see you guys yeah this was a lot of fun and you've got some other podcast shows. You've been you've been cheating on us a little bit, but uh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, you got first class you know, horror. I was uh, drunk. They came onto the bar. I, uh, you were so, out of town. That's right. Uh, you were in a different zip code. 
Um, exactly. Exactly. So, a break. <laughs> you're going to be showing up in uh, first class horror, one good scare, and of course this that we're recording today. And you've also been in uh, the uh, Sean McClure's YouTube channel. Uh, it's a two parter, I believe. Called retrospective interviews, I think is is his thing. Where, where you know, I I just tell the same stories again. I mean, that's. Uh, it's really nice that people want to talk to me, but I always give them the caveat now that it's like, and you know, and you guys were my first, so you'll always have my heart. <laughs> oh, but, thank you. Um, but it, it, the problem is that inevitably people are interested in asking the same questions. Yeah. And the problem is I can only give the same answers. I mean, I try and, you know, zhuzh it up a bit, and make yeah. them funnier each time I tell them if I can. Yeah. But Eventually, I'm going to have to start saying to people, I, yeah, I'd love to do your podcast. You can only ask me about stuff after 1998. I can't talk about the... Uh... You got to tell them, by the way, I'll just accept this amount of questions for this podcast. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> That's beautiful. King, king of the callback. All right. <laughs> yeah, king of the callback, great. Joe. Very nice. Do you have any any uh, books or in, coming out? Um, I do. I, I had a short story. My most recent published thing came out uh, not quite a year this ago, one? last October. In well, that was my collection. Yeah, that's. Oh, okay. that, I see. That's already old. That's eighteen months old. But but thank oh, you okay. for the plug, Ryan. Well, I, I I'm bringing it with Morris's, me on my trip tomorrow. Great. Um, I had a story in Mark Morris's anthology, Darkness Beckons. Um, oh, okay. Eight months ago, um, and also I I have. I've been pulled out of retirement on the screenwriting front to work on a TV project, but, um, and I, I hate like vague booking shit, but I had to sign this fairly draconian NDA. Oh, okay. So I can't okay. talk about it yet. But the reason I haven't been doing short stories for the last six months is I've been working on some TV thing. And uh, I promise you guys will be the first to know when. Oh yeah. That'll be great. Allow me to talk. It's, it, it's insane these days. Basically. How exciting. Yeah. I mean, well, Looking yeah, it, it, it was fun. You know, it was, it was very nice. Working with some old friends. Not Clive and Doug. Don't, don't gotcha. get excited. Gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. Land, but, um, I'm sure but yes, fine that, people. That's, that's what I've been doing. Oh, All man. right. That's once, great. Once we, st once we turn the recording off, I'm happy to let you guys know what it was about, but I can't. Uh, sure, sure. Oh, okay. Uh, we got to keep it. We got to keep it a secret for now. Um, exactly. Well, thank you very much for joining us. And I hope you guys had some fun. And uh, I hope you have a great weekend. What What do we usually say, Ryan? And this podcast having no beginning will have no end. Shout out to our Patreon backers, Daniel Elvin, Eric Van to Holt, David Anderson, and our returning sponsor, Don Bertram and Celebrate Imagination. Of course, the best way to support this podcast is through our Patreon at patreon.com slash BarkerCast589. Our subscribers will get exclusive access to content not available anywhere else, like our Collector's Corner video series, Rare Barker videos, and early behind-the-scenes stuff. Plus, backers in the $10 tier will also be able to choose an episode topic. And we might mail you something once in a while, depending on your location. Our supporters also get access to the exclusive channel in our Discord server. We'll be forever grateful if you consider helping us out and subscribing to our Patreon. So what's new on Patreon? Our two most current ones are The Art of Clive Barker, a 1993 Best Cutler Gallery video, and my presentation on podcasting. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you have subscribed. You can find The Clive Barker Podcast wherever you find audio. Show notes for this episode, as well as news and reviews, can be found at our website at www.clivebarkercast.com. The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial podcast and blog that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Inc. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. You can chat with us on our Facebook BarkerCast listeners group, our Facebook page, Twitter, or our Discord server. The best way to support us is to buy our book, The BarkerCast Interviews, Occupy Midian, available in hardcover on Amazon and ebook on Amazon and Apple Books. Fundraiser 10 is all about Patreon this year. Become a patron to get access to exclusive stuff, 
pick an episode topic, and maybe even get cool stuff in the mail. You can also buy a t-shirt on our Tee Public store. Go to tpublic.com and search for BarkerCast. Leave a message for us using the Speak Pipe link on our blog. Opening and ending music generously provided by Ray Norrish. Thanks for listening.